Good morning. Special welcome to any guests that we have visiting with us for the first time. We are grateful to have you here with us and welcome to those who are live streaming. This morning we're going to finish up Romans chapter 5, if you'll turn there. Romans chapter 5. This is a hard chapter for me to move on from as it has blessed me richly. I mean, just so many memories. I remember preaching outside with the wind blowing and that whole tent was being pulled away as we were looking at rejoicing and tribulation. And the next Sunday, it was just shining and glorious that God, uh, uh, the Spirit speaks his, the love of God in Christ Jesus into our hearts. And then preaching Romans 5, 5 through 8, God demonstrates his love toward us, wondering if I was going to get arrested at the end of it. And it was just a, <laughs> a beautiful season. But I think it's become one of my best friends, Romans 5. So mixed emotions as we close it out this morning. And so I pray that it has prepared your heart for Christmas by the second Adam coming into the world to save us from the effects of the first Adam had in the Garden of Eden. This Thursday night at 445, we're going to have a Christmas Eve candlelight service. Some of you let me down last year. I, I went to the elders and fought for us to have real candles and you got wax all over. Like there's probably a hundred chairs with wax on them. So no one complains about LED this, um, this Christmas Eve, okay? So you, we get LEDs and I just want you to live with it. And if you practice, maybe we'll go back to the regular candles. <laughs> that night, we're going to look at Isaiah, the gospel according to Isaiah uh, 714, and we'll seek to make it as clear as possible of this glorious gospel. And so I want you to go out to the highways and byways and bring people in to hear of the hope of Jesus Christ coming in the world to save sinners. So let's pray then and we'll finish up, Lord willing, Romans chapter 5 this morning. Father, we come for you and man, what a privilege to worship the living God because of who you are and what you have done and what you will do in this history of world. God, we worship you. We are, you've called us out to be worshipers of God. And so we gather together and we join our hearts to praise you and to, and to honor and give you kabod, glory. And I pray now as we finish up this section, God, that your spirit would, would illuminate, that there would be no one who misses this message. God, that we would all see it with eyes of faith and we would be transformed and changed by the glories and the beauties of what is in this chapter. And so, God, I look to you. Come minister to your people, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I've started each of these sermons in Romans 5 with an illustration, so I'm going to finish out with one last one. On January 16th, 2003, the shuttle Columbia lifted up from Cape Kennedy. And as it did, that some foam came off one of the compartments and it hit the left wing of the shuttle as it went out into space on its mission. It was the 113th flight of shuttles. There was concern at NASA because a hole of about 6 to 10 inches in diameter had breached the Challenger. 82 seconds into its actual flight, it was doomed. NASA discussed it but realized there was nothing that could be done. As the shuttle came back to Earth, this foam block would prove to be fatal. On February 1st, 2003, on its return, it was traveling at a speed of Mach 20, 20 times the speed of sound. It came over California and some other states were seeing it. It was flashes of light. And at 9 a.m., the shuttle disintegrated and debris was found all over Texas and Louisiana. What is my point? Well, it all started at the beginning. The shuttle looked normal, as does mankind, but there's been a fatal breach and the shuttle was doomed from the very beginning, but it didn't seem dramatic at all. So as simple as, and Adam ate. Just a little thing, when Adam ate, the ship of our humanity had a fatal breach with an absolutely certain rune that will come at judgment day, and we will stand before God, and we will break up and be destroyed if we stand before him without this remedy that we've been studying in Romans 5. And so we are celebrating and rejoicing in that we got something better than NASA that could not fix the breach. God himself would fix it. 
and he would send his son into this world on a rescue mission, a a one-man recovery that would far excel man's ruin. Oh, the grace of Almighty God that will just surpass and swallow up and cover what that first Adam did. And so we are looking in Romans 5, 15, 12 through 21 into five parts, and I want to review and we'll begin this morning. We saw the first part of the type was Adam, and Adam was a representative head. And and when Adam sinned, it took all of humanity with him. He represented us. So now we have original sin. We come into this world with Adam's sin separated from God and the guilt that comes from Adam and a bad heart that's separated from God that will have our own actual transgressions as we live upon this earth. So the first part of the type is when Adam sinned, he took the whole human race with him. He was our representative. Then we looked at the proof of this position in verses 13 through 14 to show that after that, people kept dying until the law came. And so he's just showing that 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 is why people were dying, the guilt that came from Adam. And then in verses 15 through 17, we said, now this is a parenthesis within the parenthesis, This isn't even the typology yet. That's what we'll begin this morning. Paul wants to make certain that we see the clear superiority of what Christ has done for his people. And we called it the much more section. He did much more than what the first Adam did. The second Adam did much more. And we looked at three things last time we were together. In verse 15, the, uh, Adam, now because of Adam's, it's natural. Death just comes. You don't have to work at it. All people will die. Death spread to all men. Anyone born of Adam will die. And then life, the supernatural, is it, it's given to every believer in Christ, and you must be born again into Christ. So you're born into Adam naturally, and you're born into Christ supernaturally. And so God is the one who must cause you to be born again, to be joined into the second Adam and have all the benefits thereof. And verse 16, we looked at the second contrast. One sin. The one sin of Adam destroyed all of humanity. It has is, is gone to the ends of the earth, to our own hearts. It's everywhere you look. One sin has destroyed humanity. And think of all the sin that there is and, and the many sins. And Jesus' work will cover the many. Adam, one sin brought judgment and condemnation upon us all. And Christ, with all these many sins, will bring about justification, which is the opposite of condemnation. It's God approving of us in his presence. And then the third contrast is Adam brought a reign of death that went to all men. And in Christ comes a reign of life. And guys, we are joined to an indestructible life. I cannot die. And when I breathe my last, I'll be more alive than I've ever been. I live in the reign of Christ, and as sure as he lives, I live. And so we've been taken from death unto life. We're no longer under the reign of death. We live in the reign of Christ, in the reign of life. We have the eternal life. Smile. (laughs) Come on, some of you look like Scrooge. The Grinch. The second part of the type then is what we'll take up this morning then. So all of that, we've only seen the first piece of the type and all these sub points. And now Paul's going to come back to the second part, the anti type. Paul returns now. Look in verse 18. (laughs) He says, as or even so. Verse 19, for as and even so. Verse 21, as even so. And so verse 18 is now the typology. And so I want to remind you one more time of Adam first. Look at verse 18. So then as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men, And in verse 19, for as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. And so one transgression, condemnation to all men, one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. That little foam block destroyed humanity and condemnation came to all men. And in this Greek word is you you were constituted sinners. You were made sinners. And so all of us now have that little title over our head, sinners when we come into this world. All in this ship called humanity are designated now as sinners. And so our status and our condition are tied to Adam, and we are all under condemnation, and we are all constituted sinners before God. 
And it's very important then that you catch this. There are no innocent passengers on this ship. There's a famous saying, we're not sinners because we sin, but we sin because we are sinners. And so by our very nature, because of Adam now, we come into this world by nature sinners, and we sin because we're sinners. And now we have the title, Constituted Sinners. That's the history of our world from our father Adam, and it has spread from generation to generation. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there'll be justification to all men. So one act of righteousness righted our ship, so to speak. And I asked you this morning, what was that one act? Well, it was the cross of Christ, right? Yes, but that is not the full answer. The answer is the whole life and death of Jesus Christ. In this, in this um, typology, it's one act, and we're going to call it the Christ event. And so the cross is the peak, it's the climax of his work. But what Paul's doing here is he's showing the righteousness of Christ. So it's, it's his whole, from the time he's incarnated to the time he leaves, it's this whole act of righteousness. So the Christ event. And so this is really important, so I want you to get this. This is just one unbroken, uninterrupted righteousness from the time he's born to the time he leaves the world. All it is is righteousness that Jesus Christ comes and lives and fulfills. This is the one who said, I always do the things that are pleasing to my Father. I leave my glory to come do your will, O Father. It's my food to do the will of him who sent me. And so it is him divesting himself of all of his robes and glory and being incarnated into this world. It is him going into a manger to save his people from their sins. It's him being a child and obeying his mom and dad perfectly. Little kids, I just want you to hear for Christmas, you could be saved this morning. Jesus Christ came and he was the perfect kid. And you're not, <laughs> okay? Go ask your siblings and your parents, they'll tell you. And so there's a savior for little sinners. Even for little two-year-old sinners, there's a Christ who perfectly obeyed his father when he was two years old. And this righteousness can be given to little two, four, five-year-olds this morning. I want you to see there's a savior for children. He perfectly obeyed. As a teenager, I must be about my father's business. Everyone knows teenagers need to be saved. So teenagers, we love you. And there's a, there's a savior for, for kids going through puberty. There is a savior who perfectly obeyed God as he went through puberty. He was baptized and he said, it's necessary for me to fulfill all righteousness. And he goes into the waters of baptism. The devil would come and tempt him for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And this Adam would choose righteousness instead of sin. And he would go into the garden of Gethsemane and he'd look into the cup of the wrath that he would have to drink. And he says, Father, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. What perfect righteousness in that garden. I can't imagine what he saw in that cup to sweat drops of blood. And he chose that. Your will, not my will, be done. At the cross, they're mocking him, going, save, you saved others, save yourself. And he stays on that cross to bring about redemption. And the way I was constituted a sinner from Adam, I've been constituted righteous by the works of Jesus Christ. I'm justified before this God by the second Adam who perfectly fulfilled righteousness. Theologians have called this the active and passive obedience of Jesus Christ, the passive being the passion where he went to the cross as a lamb led to slaughter and he obeyed and he brought about redemption. The active obedience of Christ was his life where he came and he fulfilled every, every jot and tittle of righteousness in the law. John Murray said, when you think of the obedience of Christ, think of this. Christ's perfect obedience was inward obedience of the heart. And so I just want you to think on this. He gave perfect obedience from the heart and from the life. 
It was inward as well as outward, as we see in the Sermon on the Mount, is what God wants from his children. It was from the inside out. And so I, do, I want you to see that Jesus Christ obeyed from the inward like no one else. Everything he did was love to his Father. Everything. And everything he did for others was love for them. It was inward and it was progressive. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. He kept learning obedience and righteousness in every stage. And it was climactic at the cross when he laid his life down for his sheep. The gospel is not be like Jesus. The gospel is not WWJD, what would Jesus do? Whatever Jesus would do, it's not what I did <laughs> at every age and every stage of my life. See, I don't need a standard to work at. Too many people, Christianity is just a standard to go work at. I, I, I need the obedience of Jesus Christ if I'm ever going to stand before a God perfectly righteous in his presence. Federalism is, that, that this is the only way so that every act of Jesus represented me and is put to my account. There's no other way I can get out of this destruction that has come from Adam. And so quit looking to anything else but our representative head. And what he did has been put to my account. I'm constituted righteous, so much so that I'm justified before God. Not guilty. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So real quick, this is just a little side note. There's a teaching called universalism, and they use this as their proof text, and I just want to quickly erase that, and we'll keep moving. Is, is that when it says, many were made sinners, which is everybody, and so many will be made righteous, which is everybody, so universalism, everybody then will be saved. And so it makes sense if it's a numerical comparison. But the whole epistle has been showing that we're under wrath and we're under judgment in chapters 1 through 3. And so why was Paul eager to preach the gospel if everybody's going to be saved? Why is he giving his life and being beat to a pope if everybody gets saved and demanding faith and that those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved? So I'm telling you, it's not numerical comparison, but it's a group. Everyone who's in Adam has been in, constituted a sinner, and everyone who's in Christ is constituted righteous. And so all in Adam condemned, all in Christ justified. The best news ever is you can come out this morning from being in Adam. You can come out and then thank you, Lord, the way out is by the grace of God and me believing and not trying to work my way out of this problem and being a good person and going to church there's a way to come out this morning. It's by believing in the second Adam and what he's come, the Christ event who lived the life you should have and died the death you deserved. Can you, can you believe this? You have the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith. And it's always been by representative heads. I'm as righteous as Jesus Christ this morning clothed in him. I want to read you a poem from one of my favorites, in history. His name was Robert Murray McShane. And Robert Murray McShane died when he was 29, and he did more than anyone could do in 100 years with those years. And he wrote this poem. Um, <coughs> it's called Jehovah Sit a Canoe. I think it's going to be up on the screen even. Do you guys got it? Oh, look at that. I'm getting kind of cool. <laughs> I didn't even know this stuff existed a couple years ago. I once was a stranger to the grace and to God. I knew not my danger and I felt not my load. Though friends spoke in rapture, Christ on the tree, Jehovah sit a canoe was nothing to me. I off read with pleasure to soothe or engage Isaiah's wild measure or John's simple page. But even when they pictured the blood sprinkled tree, Jehovah Siddha canoe meant nothing to me. My tears from the waters of Zion would roll. I wept as the waters delivered a soul. But thought not my sin had nailed to the tree. Jehovah Siddha canoe meant nothing to me. When free grace awoke me by light from on high, 
Legal fear shook me. I trembled to die. No refuge, no safety in self could I see. Jehovah sit a canoe, my savior must be. My terror all vanished before that sweet name. My guilty fears vanished with boldness. I came to drink at the fountain, giving and free. Jehovah sit a canoe is all things to me. Jehovah sit a canoe, my treasure, my boast. Jehovah sit a canoe, I never can be lost. By thee I shall conquer, by flood and by field. My cable, my anchor, my breastplate, my shield. And when treading the valley of the shadow of death, this watchword shall rally my faltering breath. From when from life's fever my God sets me free, Jehovah sit a canoe, my death song shall be. The obedience of Christ. His righteousness is my only boast. What a gospel. Can it be this simple and straightforward, just one Adam and a second Adam? Can centuries of salvation history that are recorded in the Old Testament just be ignored? And so here's going to come Paul's objectors and he's going to answer them. What what about the law of Moses? What about Genesis 3 all the way to Matthew? Matthew. Do you just throw that all out, the whole history of Israel and the law? How does that fit? You're just saying one Moses, one to one Adam and a second Adam. What about the rest of the Bible? And so Paul's going to expound it. Why was the law given? And that's our fifth point. If you'll look with me, I've entitled it Conclusion. Conclusion. (laughs) Took me a while to come up with that. I hope you like it. The law came. And so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And so let's first look at what Paul has already said in Romans about the law. And in Romans 3, 19 through 20, we spent a whole week on it. The law was not given for you to be justified. It was never given for you to go work at it and get right with God. That is not the purpose of the law. In Romans 5, 12 through 19 The law was not even necessary to condemn us. We're already condemned under Adam. (laughs) So Paul, why the law? Why would you give us the law? And the answer in 520 is so that the transgression might increase. Is that why God gave the law? He wanted more sin? Well, let's look at it. The law came in. It's the same word as in verse 12 where it said sin entered with Adam. And so it's got a para on the front. So the, the law came in alongside of. And so the law entered alongside of what? The sin that had already entered into the world from Adam. Sin came in. And the law comes alongside of sin. And so the law was meant to exist in relationship to the sin that was already there. And so the law does not cause sin, but it does something to sin. And what it does, Paul says here in verse 20, is it causes the transgression to increase. So the law brought out the true nature and magnitude of sin. The law helps us see uh, what sin truly is. It's like a, a mirror showing you your heart or maybe a CT scan getting right into that heart and showing you it's rebellion. And so let's look at ways in which the law increases sin. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? No way. May Ginnatai perish the thought. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, (coughs) excuse me, you shall not covet. So the law increased our knowledge of sin. The law didn't make Paul covetous. He was already was covetous, but when it came and said, don't do it, it revealed it and it showed it to Paul. He said, I started coveting like crazy. The law defines sin for us. It's the written law of God. And this is saying the law then turns into a transgression because God is saying, this is what you cannot do and what you can do. And it's a transgression now against God when we sin. I want you to hear this. Sin is rebellion against God. It's against God. 
God has given a sense of right and wrong and a moral code, but they don't know that it's directly sinning against God, all conscience. But David knew the horror of sin when he said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. And the law also exposes sin's power and, and it, it reveals um, how much we want it. So when, it, when we put slogans like just say no to drugs, it, it just stirs it up and aggravates it and draws out its power. So thou shall not brings I want out. So the law unveils sin's deceit because we want to excuse our conduct. You could be sitting here this morning and your whole life you've been a spin doctor and you can blame your parents, you can blame society, your teachers, your siblings, you, you just everything, you're just a spin doctor at everything in your life and explaining it away. But what Paul is doing here by the Holy Spirit is, is we can't call sin by a lesser name or deny it. Men say they're weak. I just need a little help. But the scriptures show the depth of the foulness he, Paul's going to call it the exceedingly sinfulness of sin. And the law reveals how bad and how deep it is in every heart, and you're going to have to own it. And when revival occurs is when we realize the depth of sin within us and the character of the one who it, it is against, and that his wrath rightfully falls upon us. And Jehovah Siddiquanu is our hope. We cry out to God and it makes us beggars and Christ becomes a treasure hidden in a field. And he doesn't just become something that we pull out whenever we feel like it. He becomes our very life for me to live as Christ. So I want you to hear this. The law did not subdue sin, but made it rebellion against the revealed will of God. And it turns us into our own Adam now as we transgress a known law daily against God. So I'll ask you this morning, what does grace have to do with any of that? Well, look in verse 20. Where sin increased, and I declare to you that it did, <laughs> we became more culpable. We became more guilty, more defiled, more stiff-necked and rebellious, and more utterly sinful. And that is the history, and that is this world, and it's our own hearts. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. As God gave the law, he also gave sacrifices, pointing to how sin might be punished and its guilt removed. And at the very time God gave Moses, he gave Aaron. And he could have left us in ignorance under his wrath. He could have left us comparing ourselves to others like many do today. But God gave the law so you could see what your condition truly is before this God, and, and, and to realize what you need. John Bunyan shares this interesting illustration. He said, say you're, you're just born deformed and you're hideous looking, and you live on an island and everyone is exactly the same way, and you don't know you're hideous. And all of a sudden, he says, one day this beautiful person shows up on the island, all of a sudden you realize, oh, I'm hideous. And he said the same thing as we're, we're hideous before God and all of our sin and we don't know it and we're all the same way and we're just living in it saying, isn't this great? You know, let's keep enjoying life and be, drink and be merry. Tomorrow we die. And, and, and all of a sudden, the law is given and we see the beauty and the, it's holy, righteous and good. And then Jesus Christ enters the world and now we realize the sinfulness of sin and who we are. And, and so we're sin increased. Grace abounded all the more. At the cross of Christ, the law of God and the grace of God met, and each was fully satisfied at that cross. What a bright light this verse is in the midst then of sin and condemnation. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Word for increase, it's translated twice here. It says where sin increased, Grace increased. But Paul used two different Greek words. For sin, there's much. <clears throat> there's many. The verb has the idea of a numerical increase. It, it kept growing and it kept multiplying and we, we see it. 
But grace is an interesting word here. He uses the verb to abound, to overflow, to have more than enough. So it's not numerically increasing. It doesn't have to do with numbers, but it has to do with excess. To make sure we don't miss the point, Paul puts a little uh, prefix in front of it, the word huper, and so, uh, which means super, more. And so the word here means super, abundance, abundant excess. And so I hope you get this grace overwhelms than what I was in Adam. Sin increased and grace just overwhelms excess, comes and completely conquers and defeats what happened in the first Adam. What I was in Adam breaks my heart. How long I lived in rebellion and transgressing and against God. And all that sin and guilt and death is just washed away in superabundance in the grace of God. J.B. Phillips, in a paraphrase, said this, Though sin is shown to be wide and deep, wide and deep, thank God His grace is wider and deeper still. Donald Gray Barnhouse said, When sin reached a high water mark, grace completely just flooded the world. So the idea is that of an overflowing, mighty flood were let loose, sweeping everything before it. Lloyd-Jones says, I like the word engulfed. Such an abundance that it just drowns and engulfs everything from Adam. And John said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For out of his fullness, overflowing, we've all received grace upon grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. What the last Adam does to the effects of the first Adam are overwhelming. Grace washes it all away. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. The overwhelming flood of grace. Grace upon grace. The manifold grace of God. And I have people tell me, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. Surely God couldn't forgive me. And I tell you this morning, you don't know what Christ has done. Grace superabounds for any sin that's been committed under Adam. Paul wrote this in 1 Timothy 1. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all, putting to death Christians. And yet for this reason I found mercy in order that in me, as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. What a model of grace. I just love abundant, overflowing, superfluous grace. I'm going to just give you a quote by Donald Gray Barnhouse. I have no doubt that in the ages to come, what we might call billions of years from now, (coughs) there will be angels who will look at you and me with awe and wonder and say to each other, there are two of the saints. They were on earth in the times of the rebellion. They were dead in trespasses and sins. They were ungodly sinners. They were the enemies of God, but he loved them when they were like that. Think of that. How marvelous is his love. How great is his condescension. How free is his grace. He did all of that for them. And we'll say to the angels, you're right. And giving all the glory to him. He's the wonderful one. He's the gracious one. There's none like unto him. And amid all the ceaseless activities of heaven, while we're associated with him as the queen is with the king, we shall ever point to him as the source of all grace 
and be in ourselves the exhibit of the exceeding riches of the grace of God. And we'll cast our thrones down at his feet and all the glory will go to the second Adam. Salvation belongs to our God. And in verse 21, we'll close out. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's going to be the introduction to the next four chapters. And so I'm going to just briefly introduce it, and then we'll dig into what that means. But it, it's a hint clause. And this hint clause, it's an explanation of why God has been so gracious, why grace over superabounds. Death was a reign. And I want you to catch this. Grace is a reign. Draw near to the throne of grace. And so I want you to understand this. Grace is not just an attitude. It's a power that reaches out to those who apart from it will perish. So grace is not an offer of help. It is help. This grace will bring us to eternal life. And that's the argument of our next section is the security, the eternal security of the believer. The, the reign of grace not only saves us, but it sanctifies us. It grows us. It's a, it's a power that will change, transform, and it will bring us to the, to the gates of heaven. And so not Adam, sin, condemnation, death, law, uh, the enemy can ever thwart grace. It's a power that is unconquerable, and you've been brought into the reign of grace. And so I just think of these two reigns. Follow sin. Sin will rob you of your innocence and your character. Follow sin, and it's going to wither away your health. Follow sin, and it's going to destroy friendships and families and laughter and innocence and hope and contentment. Follow sin, and it will usher you to damnation as you stagger through the door and enter into the eternal death. It's a reign and I'm begging for you to come out this morning for something better called the reign of life. How different is the king whose name is grace? God sees us staggering, and he comes alongside to help and to bear us up. Grace sees us destitute, and it pours inexhaustible riches of Christ and the Father into our laps. Grace sees us dying and imparts eternal life. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Sin takes, grace gives. And so I love to be in the reign of grace. And this truth is what is going to plow our way into Romans 6. It's a power that will change our lives. You're made new, and the only thing that can explain it is being born again into the second Adam. And this grace will conform you into the image of Christ. And he'll bring hardships and trials and tribulations. He'll bring many, many things to conform you into the image of Christ. If you're suffering under great affliction, that's the love of God. And he's at work. You're no longer a servant to sin. You have a new master. So law is given, and it wasn't to break the bondage of sin. It was to stir it up. Christ, grace is given to break the bondage and to set you free from sin, to begin to change and transform you till you're set free from it for all of eternity. The first Adam, this is a quote from a commentator, the first Adam dies and we die in him, but the second Adam dies and we live in him. The first Adam's grave proclaims death and the second Adam's grave announces life. I'm the resurrection and the life. We look into the grave of the one and we see uh, only darkness, corruption, and death. And we look into the grave of the other and we find there only light, corruption, and life. We look into the grave of the one and find that he is still there, his dust still mingling with its fellow dust above it. And we look into the grave of the other and we find that he's not there. He's risen. And he's risen as our forerunner into the heavenly paradise, the home of the risen and the redeemed. And we look into the grave of the first Adam and see in him the first fruits of them that have died, the millions that have gone down to that prison house whose gates he opened. And we look into the tomb of the second Adam 
And we see in him the first fruits of that bright multitude, that glorified band who are to come forth from that cell, triumphing over death and rising to immortal life. As certain as Christ is seated at the right hand of God, so we are seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to close out. And I'll tell you, this has um, been a hard year. And we began it in January with your pastor pleading with God for the, uh, a revival of 2020. And I had no idea what God had planned for us. And this is the last sermon in Romans in 2020. And what I want you to do is, what, what has it done in your heart? What we have learned is the first Adam has brought a ruin that no, no man can remedy. And he sent his son into the world as a second Adam. And that act of obedience can make us right with God and restore us back to him. And what my prayer is, this revival is that what you realize, what you have in this gospel is what Paul exalted. And remember the three exaltations? The third one is I just exalt in God. And this gospel brings you back to the favorable presence of God loved and accepted. And what we have is God. And if he takes away everything else, some of you have lost grandchildren, children, and parents, and health. If everything's taken away, is this God enough? That's what this gospel is. He's, he's better than life. And, and this gospel brings you back to him. And we, we get, we're a people that have God. Let goods and kindred go. Let everything else go. And he's been chipping away all year. And I pray that as you look at the beauties of Romans 1 through 5, you could just look this morning and say, I have God. I have everything. In Christ Jesus. That's the revival I've been praying for. And it's been happening in some of your hearts. And there's still some that, that still don't understand the gospel. It isn't religion. It isn't keeping some rules. It isn't voting Republican and having a gun. It's being made right with God. Is that your gospel? Or are you just Baptist? I pray that it's God. And the way I want to close out is the question I want you to wrestle with is do you want the giver more than, more than the gifts? That's the gospel to me. And so um, we got a song that was written. Uh, Jordan wrote this song. And he and I have just been praying that we could take this message together anywhere and everywhere. And we're nearing 10,000 people that we've gotten to share this with. And so this morning... This, this is our hearts, so we want to come um, have you close your eyes, or you can leave them open, but I want you to wrestle with a whole year of Romans and this gospel, and I just want you to see is, do you love the giver? And I'm not just talking about health, wealth, and prosperity that just want gifts. I, I see it on a daily basis in my own heart and in your hearts, where there's certain things that you don't even realize, but you, you want those gifts more than God. And there's things called family and different things called health and all these things that I can't be, I want those more than God. And so I want this gospel is this morning that you can just exult in your tribulations and you can exult in God. So I'm going to pray and then we'll have that song. Father, I pray. I pray for the revival of 2020. God, we're at the end of it and you did more than we could have hoped or dreamed. God, you brought providences that took away things that we treasured and loved more than anything. God, I pray that every heart in this room believes this gospel, that they're under the reign now of grace, the rule and reign of Christ. And I pray that that is better than life, better than their necessary food to have Jesus Christ as their bridegroom. And Lord, let us throw away everything else and now lift our eyes only to you and to treasure you and exult in you and love you with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. God, do that work by your Holy Spirit. Shed abroad in our hearts the love of God in Christ Jesus and let every heart exult this morning, I pray in the name of Christ.
Amen.